in that process of preparing my heart and mind for Easter and for the Lenten series of sermons for me involves the purchasing and reading of at least a dozen new books this year. But I want to introduce you to two books that have significantly impacted this series of sermons. On the Road to the Cross, written by Burkhart, and Power Passion. That Power Passion was a very interesting book written by Wells. And if you like that kind of approach to Lent, where you're actually walking in the shoes of some of the characters of Lent, then I certainly refer those books to you. And on Wednesday night Bible study, we've been using quite a bit of the material coming out of uh, the road to the cross and has helped us with some creative approaches to the way we've been doing Bible study. Well, you will know that Jesus had a profound impact on men and women. And that impact is seen not only in his teachings, it's seen perhaps even more poignantly and powerfully in the way that he lived his life, in his daily actions from day to day. Many of these people that Jesus called literally dropped everything. They dropped their fishing nets, their tax collecting tables, their medical practice, and they set out to follow Jesus, simply in obedience to an invitation, follow me. They were well-connected in society, many of them. They were wealthy, some of them. They wielded significant influence. And all of this would be lost if people knew they were actually following a radical rabbi by the name of Jesus from a hick town called Nazareth. So the question we come to this morning, is it possible to be a follower of Jesus and do it on the QT? Is it possible to be a ruler by day and a worshiper only by night? The Easter story introduces us to two men who I think tried to do just that. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They've been accused of leading a double life. But did they really? We learn a great deal from Matthew's account, chapter 27, verse 57 to 60, which was read to us earlier. Joseph is a rich man. In the same gospel, of course, Jesus earlier has made that rather mystifying statement. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, Matthew 19 and 24. And so Joseph already has what seems to be an insurmountable obstacle to his pursuit for discipleship. He's rich. There were many wealthy men in the Roman Empire, and few of them that I've read about were actually honorable. Joseph, however, doesn't flaunt or use his wealth for self-aggrandizement, but he's willing to sacrifice as a disciple of Jesus. He takes the risk of going to the governor and asking for the lifeless body of Jesus. He becomes the disciple who takes the place of Peter and James and John and the rest who don't seem to be around anymore. The disciples of John the Baptist, at least, came forward and claimed his body. But it takes a secret disciple of Jesus to come out of the shadows and claim his body. His loyal disciples were nowhere to be found. In burying Jesus, Joseph does what the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 and 22 failed to do. He put his life at risk, and he gives to help the poor. Who could be more poor than someone who had no place to be buried? We're not privy to Joseph's inner feelings. He claims, prepares, and buries the body of Jesus. We don't know how he feels about all of that. We don't know if he's done it for some reason out of guilt or he's done it out of sorrow. We're not told that. We're only told by John that he's a disciple and that he's rich, and that he finds the courage to go to Pilate and to do these things. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and therefore a leader. According to John's gospel, he comes to Jesus by night. 
Nicodemus has quite a challenge ahead of him too in his desire to follow Jesus. As a Pharisee, he's a member of the ruling party that gave John the Baptist such a rough time in the wilderness, if you remember the story. He's also a member of the Sanhedrin, and therefore he's in Rome's pocket, as all of the Sanhedrin were. And he comes to Jesus by night. In other words, he comes in person, and he comes incognito. He doesn't come in an official capacity. He comes in a personal capacity. But he does call Jesus rabbi, which gives us a clue that he might be considering becoming a disciple of his. Nicodemus, who, by the way, only appears in John's gospel, and Joseph of Arimathea are actually very similar characters when you juxtapose the two and look at them carefully. Together they represent the apprehension and doubt seen throughout the four Gospels as to whether discipleship is compatible with wealth and with privilege and with power. Such people have a significant contribution to make to the Gospel story, and they make their appearances, it seems, their primary appearances at exactly that point when the regular disciples are no longer visible. But it seems they come out into the light only at the end of the day, once their work, their public role, has been carried out. They may have a personal faith, but except for their actions on Good Friday evening, it's really not clear how personal their faith is and how much of a difference their faith made until now. And so they raise the haunting question, can I be a Christian by night? It would appear that both of these men pretended to be what they weren't. After his late night encounter with Jesus in John 3, Nicodemus becomes a follower of Jesus. Later, he defended Jesus before the high priest, and he also asked the Sanhedrin to follow its own rules and respect its own rights for the accused. In the end, they did neither, and Nicodemus was ridiculed for his efforts. You can read about it in John chapter 7, verses 40 to 52. We don't know exactly when it was that Joseph of Arimathea became a disciple, but by his actions in the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus seems to give indication that he did become a disciple. During the life and ministry of Jesus, both of these men seem to have continued with life as usual. They remained part of the Jewish governing council, and neither let on that they were also followers of Jesus. You need to remember, the Sanhedrin is the council that condemned Jesus and sent him to Pilate for execution. And Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea are members of that council. As both popularity and contempt for Jesus begins to increase, and he eventually becomes a threat to the religious and political status quo, the Sanhedrin finally comes to the conclusion, Jesus must die. Tradition says that Nicodemus spoke on Christ's behalf at his trial before Pilate, but that's only tradition. The Bible itself tells us that Joseph of Arimathea did not agree with the Sanhedrin's decision. After Jesus was crucified, both men made their faith very public and their identification with Jesus Christ very public as they claim his body and prepare it for burial. Now, it's not surprising that these men kept their faith in Jesus a secret, really. But isn't it amazing that it was at the point when they stood to lose the most when it was dangerous to do so, that they took the greatest risk? It would have been much easier for them to have acknowledged their loyalty and their discipleship when Jesus was at the high pitch of his popularity, when he was famous, it seems, with everybody, except, of course, the Sanhedrin, the scribes and the Pharisees. 
But it's only when Jesus seems to be at the low point of his popularity that they take the incredible risk of coming out and being identified with him. Would have been so much easier to have come out when he was at the high pitch of his popularity. Instead, they chose to do the opposite. They chose to take a stand when they had the most to lose. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea really did have a lot to lose. They were rich. They were respected. They were powerful. And they both had a great deal of potential, I suspect, in their respective positions. Their lives were lived out in a context of political and religious power. Now, that's an unusual combination for us today, but it wasn't so unusual in ancient Israel. The Sanhedrin ruled the nation, not just on the Sabbath, but every other day of the week as well. As members of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea would have been well respected. Their wives would have been well respected in the community. The children had a promising future because of who their parents were. And public confession of faith in Christ would have cost them everything they had spent a lifetime trying to build up. Listen to to the way Luke puts it in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 to 26. Jesus said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his very self, lose his own soul? These two men had a great deal to lose, a great deal to give up by coming out of the shadows and following Jesus. Because it's going to cost you something to follow Jesus. In many ways, that really hasn't changed, has it? Those who are open and vocal about their faith in Christ will still put themselves at considerable risk. In recent days, CNN has been reporting that persecution against other religions is on the rise in China and that nearly 80 million Christians are the primary target for their persecution. Communist China, did you realize there are 80 million Christians there? And they're being persecuted. It's not the only place in the world where confession of faith means the risk of torture, pain, or martyrdom. In our culture, persecution looks a little more subtle. It looks a little more like being overlooked for a promotion at work, perhaps. Or maybe subtly losing your job altogether. It sometimes means being denied admission to that school or that university that you want to get into may even mean being rejected by your family, may even mean being divorced because of your faith, or treated with disdain by other people. It seems the only intolerable thing in our tolerant society are the values of Christ displayed in the lives of his followers. As you read between the lines, you sense that there is a bit of dissatisfaction in the lives of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, and that there's a longing for something better in their hearts and in their minds. They were honorable men who just didn't feel fulfilled or comfortable with the status quo of their religious or political lives. They also didn't seem to feel comfortable with the double lives they were living. There's nothing more disconcerting and miserable than an honorable man or woman trying to maintain a double standard. You can only sit on the picket fence for so long before the discomfort forces you to jump off one side or the other. You either stay with what you know but don't really trust or find fulfilling, or you reach out and embrace the values of Christ and trust Him to take care of you rather than living a double standard and allowing your soul to rot in the process. Because that's what happens to pretenders. That's what happened to people who simply pretend. But unfortunately, 
There are many who continue to play games of deceit and counterfeit until their conscience is destroyed. The only fear is that they might get caught and then be exposed for what they really are. Not even disciples by night, much less by day. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea lived a secret life for some time. That's the story. They knew that if they confessed their faith in Christ, they would end up being branded as heretics who had turned their backs on the Jewish faith as well as their political hopes and dreams. They knew that you can't mix water and oil. The Pharisees and the Sadducees in the Sanhedrin were right. Jesus and his teachings were absolutely destructive to their religious, political, and economic status quo. Jesus and his teachings are equally destructive to our status quo. Whether we're talking about our religious status quo, our political, or our economic status quo. If Jesus had his way, the temple system that gave them their power and their wealth and their status would disappear. He did succeed, of course. The Romans destroyed the temple in A.D. 70. And the Jewish homeland ceased to exist for almost 1,900 years. Christianity is no less dangerous and decisive today, except in places where it has been watered down. Properly taught and lived, it still disrupts the status quo. Its followers still challenge the barbaric and monstrous practices that happen even in our respectable society. It still challenges and does away with injustice and power and greed. And those who benefit from all such practices continue to see Christianity as dangerous and his teachings as subversive. That's why communist China is so threatened by Christianity. Because what it believes completely flies in the face of what they want people to believe. It's a threat to economic, political, and even religious structures because people who follow Jesus have been radically and completely changed from the inside out. And if you've been completely and radically changed by Jesus from the inside out, you're going to find that you're not going to fit very well in the system that we call the world in which we live. Who we are, what we are, How we live our lives invariably becomes a part of the culture in which we live. Can't be a secret disciple. And if you were an authentic disciple, you're going to be in trouble. Jesus didn't say, you might have a little discomfort out there in the world. He said, in the world, you will have trouble. If you're going to live an authentic Christian life, that is. It's the same in our culture. Christians subvert the status quo with their new and transformed lives. That's why the crosses are disappearing. I want to say thank you to Arnold Gretz de Noble. Arnold gave a book to me on Wednesday night. It's called When the Crosses Are Gone. It's fairly much speaking into the American culture, but we're not that different. And it's talking about a very intentional approach across the United States to get the crosses out of public places and why they might be doing that. They're doing it because the cross speaks of something very subversive. The cross speaks against something very different than the way we want to organize our society. The cross has something to say that is simply not comfortable with the world. And so the crosses have to go. Because the world doesn't want to hear that statement. I commend the book to you. It's written by Michael Youssef. It's only a matter of time before this new life would either break forth or become finally and fully abandoned by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They couldn't live the double life forever. They couldn't keep it on. It was one or the other. I embrace the Christ or I abandon the Christ.
It's not clear if they witnessed Jesus' arrest and his trial and his torture and his crucifixion, or if they just heard about it, because you'll know the whole trial, all six of them, were illegal. So what was taking place didn't involve the entire Sanhedrin as it should have. Either way, their actions and their attitudes speak very clearly to those of us who would seek to follow Jesus and do so with courage and with conviction. First of all, they remind us, all of us, that we need to put our past behind us. That happened to these two men when they claimed the lifeless body of Christ, took it down from the cross, wrapped it in cloth and spices, and placed it in Joseph's own tomb. That changed everything for these two men. For them, that was the leap off the proverbial picket fence. They'd been at odds with the high priest and Sanhedrin even before Jesus was arrested, but this was the last straw. This is what John says. After this, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take away the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one because he feared the Jewish authorities. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body away. You can only hold two conflicting views together for so long before it becomes like a boiling pot that eventually boils over and blows the lid off the pot. You have to eventually choose one thing or the other. No amount of rationalization will keep the two in harmony or the soul at peace. Faith in Christ and love for the world are simply not compatible. When you reach that point where you know you must choose between two conflicting worldviews, you're going to need to dig deep and be courageous. It took a great deal of courage for Joseph to go to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. It took a great deal of bravery for Nicodemus to go along with him. Both of them had chosen secret discipleship out of fear. They didn't want to lose their place. But now they step out in courage and they invite the wrath of the most powerful people and systems of their day. You may not think of yourself as a particularly brave person, but it's simply not possible to live an authentic Christian life without courage. It takes courage. It takes courage to stand up for Jesus at school when everyone else is ridiculing you and ridiculing him. It takes courage to stand up at work when what the boss wants you to do is simply not compatible with the values of Jesus which you've embraced and which you believe in. The amazing thing about it, though, friends, is that courage comes to us when we trust in the Lord and do his will. When you start walking in his way, the courage you need to get where he wants you to go is made available to you. Choosing to live an authentic Christian life will not only mean that you have to put your past behind you and live courageously, it will also mean recognizing that faith is simply not a private matter. In fact, it's very public. There came a time when Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had to take action, and what they did could not be done in secret. Maybe they could come to Jesus in secret by night. Maybe they could try to live a life that was in the public and another life in private, but you couldn't do in private what they now were challenged to do. Going to Pilate meant that Herod would also know which meant that the chief priests would also know, and the Sanhedrin would also know. And as members of the Sanhedrin, their secret discipleship was all over. The two men simply had to recognize that being a follower of Jesus and being a member of the Sanhedrin is no longer compatible. But think about the credibility they brought to the life and teachings of Jesus when they decided to follow him. From their prestigious and powerful positions in the Sanhedrin, think about the credibility that they brought to the message as they went public with what they believed. Think about the implications for Christianity if they hadn't had the courage to step out publicly and declare their allegiance to Jesus. Have you ever stopped to think about it? 
If they hadn't claimed the body of Jesus, it would have been left on the cross to decay. Or it would have been discarded in the city dump. What would have happened to the empty tomb? Where would the eyewitnesses have gone? Where would the women have gone on Sunday morning to anoint the body of Jesus? The Easter story we know and love so much would have been a very different story were it not for two secret disciples who became willing to make their faith a very public matter. There's a movement afoot today that says faith is private and does not belong in the public domain. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Genuine faith puts our identity in Christ and our daily activity together in such a way that speaks powerfully and effectively to the world around us. When you choose to live your life by the values of Christ, the world around you will see your courage. They will see the honor and respect that you have. They will see your compassion. They will see your willingness not only to serve Jesus, but to serve the wounded of the world as well. We've said repeatedly, That following Jesus will cost you something, and both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea perfectly illustrate that for us this morning. I have no idea how much they paid for the shroud and the spices, and that's not where you go if you want to measure the extent of their sacrifice. They put their reputations, their positions, their status, their futures, and their money all on the line when they made their faith public by claiming the body of Christ and caring for it. For some time, they kept their faith private for fear of the Jews, but when they were confronted with something that needed to be done, and it was obvious that they were the ones to do it, they stopped playing it safe and embraced the risk of publicly following Jesus. It takes that kind of courage and willingness to pay the price to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. And why is that so? Why does somebody who follows Jesus have to be willing to sacrifice? Why is the sacrifice necessary? Well, all our hopes and dreams for tomorrow involve some degree of sacrifice today, don't they? Every serious student recognizes that this is true. You have to sacrifice today If you want to get the good grades tomorrow to get into the education system you want to get into, every serious financial investor knows as well that you sacrifice today to reap dividends tomorrow. Every planner for the future recognizes that. Nicodemus and Joseph recognized what they were going to lose. But they also knew that what they were going to lose will be far less than what they were going to gain. Their future was far more important than holding on to what they had. They recognized that trusting Jesus was much safer than clinging to the past and hoping things would be different. And there's a message there for those of us who have it very comfortable. You have everything we need. Hold on loosely to it. Jesus may ask you to let it go. And if you can't let it go when he asked you to, are you sure you're following him? Are you sure you're an authentic follower of Christ? These two men knew that trusting Jesus was the right thing to do. So the clear message from these two men to us this morning is that we should not expect that following Jesus will not cost us anything. The story tells us that Joseph even gave up his own tomb to become the burial place for Jesus. Now, that was no small thing, friends. These tombs were actually carved into stone and were extremely expensive. This was a huge sacrifice for Joseph to make. There's no way to follow Jesus without sacrifice. His way is always the way of the cross. And his way is also relentlessly incarnational. We are constantly called as followers of Jesus to make him flesh, to make him visible by the way we live our lives. 
The world would see Jesus. They will only see him if we are authentic followers of Jesus and willing to pay the price to do that. We don't know what happened to Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea after Good Friday. They disappear from the Gospels, and they aren't mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. Apart from the stuff of myths and legends, we don't know anything more about them. What we do know is that they recognize the need to stop being secret disciples of Jesus and courageously stepped out in faith to live genuine Christian lives, even though it costs them a great deal. And that's their Easter message to us. It's their example. Easter is a reminder that there is room at the cross and the empty tomb, even for those who've been pretending to follow Jesus. Secret disciples who've not yet found the courage to step out of the shadows and into the light where they can be recognized as men and women of faith. The grace, love, and forgiveness of the crucified and risen Lord is more than adequate to change our hearts and inspire our serves as we commit ourselves to him, to seeing him more clearly, to loving him more dearly, and to following him more nearly. If you've been trying to do it in private, trying to follow him in private, trying to be committed to him in private, and have not gone public, these two men are a reminder. It's time to come out of the shadows. It's time to step up and be a follower of Jesus. I'm going to ask you to sing number 292 in your songbook. It's a reminder that nothing but the blood of Jesus can save us. Not our pretense, not our pride, not our favorite ritual, not our favorite ceremony, not our uniform, not our place in the band, our place in the songsters, nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's why the cross was necessary, because nothing but the blood of Jesus could save us. Nothing. 